Thank you for joining this panel discussion on diversity in the medical technology ecosystem. Diversity, particularly racial and gender diversity, have been long discussed topics made timely again by current events. In this panel discussion, we're hoping to bring it a little closer to home as we examine what the playing lo field looks like specific to the med tech environment and share success stories about what is working and what each of us can do to help make the progress. But first, I want to introduce this stellar panel. Donna Collins is the Senior Director of Global Marketing at Stryker Neurovascular. She's been a senior leader in the med tech industry for close to 30 years at companies ranging from startup to Fortune 100 companies, notably Elixir Medical, Silk Road Medical, Medtronic, and ACS Guidance. She's also an advisor and a lecturer at Astia, which is an investment network focused on high growth companies powered by women. I met Donna at the start of her journey in med tech, and she has left some indelible impressions on me in the area of diversity and so much more. So I'm thrilled that she agreed to share her knowledge and expertise on, and experience on this panel here today. Maria Sainz is another strong presence in the medtech world with experience as a serial CEO of a number of startup companies. And she's currently at Igea Medical, which is a women's health company um, looking to, solve, uh, to get new therapies out for women suffering from menorrhagia. Um, she has been involved in the medtech industry early in her career, Guidant and Boston Scientific. Uh, where after Guidant was acquired, she led the cardiac surgery division at Boston Scientific. And a couple of years back, she was requested by Paul Yock, who's the director at Stanford Biodesign, together with the Fogarty Institution to help spearhead an initiative to promote diversity targeted to small and medium-sized companies in health tech. That initiative is now known by, as Diversity by Doing Health Tech, or D by D, and has produced some fascinating work, which I'm hoping Maria will share with us today. Now, Kwame Ulmer is a venture partner at Wavemaker 360 Health, and the principal at Ulmer Ventures, which is a regulatory strategy consulting firm. He's also held upper management positions at Danaher Corporation and was a deputy director at the FDA. So to say this mover and shaker has done it all is pretty close to the truth. Beyond his extensive work experience, Kwame brings passion and energy to the importance of diversity in our industry as a co-founder of MedTech Color, which has a stated goal to create 100 new black or brown CEOs, increase the number of African Americans who enter and stay in the MedTech industry. We'll explore why that's important in a second. And to drive clinical tri trial enrollment of 10,000 patients from underrepresented ethnic groups. So welcome all of you, and I'm so grateful you're willing to put in the time and energy to discuss this important topic. Let me lay some groundwork, and then I'm going to toss the first question over to you. A lot of research has been done on the benefits of diversity, which for today's discussion, we will largely consider gender and racial diversity, while acknowledging that there are very many other forms of diversity. We've been hearing about the benefits of diverse workforces, executive teams, boards, investment groups for over a decade. And of particular resonance for our industry, which thrives on innovation, we've heard that diverse individuals see things, see a problem in different ways and come up with more creative and different solutions, increasing the odds that it's gonna, they're gonna hit. In fact, in 2018, a Boston consulting group study quantified that innovation, showing that there was a statistically significant correlation between the diversity of a management team, which brought in consistently 19% higher diversity revenues, in other words, revenues from newer products, um, in innovation revenues <laughs> in, um, pro from newer products, compared to groups that were not as diverse. And yet, if we look at the stats in our industry, it's, it's somewhat dismaying. In healthcare, a majority of the entry-level pool of employees is female, with biomedical engineers making up nearly half of that, and, and latest stats saying that females make up more medical school students than males at this point. 
And in 2020, earlier this year, a McKinsey survey showed that in the STEM fields, women held just 38% of the management level positions and get promoted at 85% of the rate of men. And to be more granular yet, women of color represent 18% of the entry level pool and yet only 5% of upper management. Whereas white men represent 35% of the entry pool and 60% of upper management. So given those stats, um, if we truly believe that innovation is the lifeblood of our industry, and we've shown that innovation is driven by diversity, where is it gonna come from if the management teams who have the power to set the culture become less diverse as they climb the ranks? And in addition to that, is thinking about diversity a luxury for large companies that have DNI initiatives and can focus on it, whereas small companies have to be heads down getting the product out the door and it, it just is something they can't think about? I'd love to hear all your perspectives on this. Let's, let's start with Maria. Thank you, Marga, and it's uh, wonderful to be here in this discussion with all of you. Um, interesting that you're asking, is it a luxury? I wouldn't say it's a luxury, but it definitely is easier for larger organizations that have more means and more resources to dedicate a portion of those to really advancing the cause of inclusiveness and diversity. It is definitely more challenging in smaller organizations to do the same with more limited resources and with higher priority around uh, just getting the product out, as you rightfully put it, as well as sort of uh, ultimately a, an exit strategy for, for their investors. I still believe that there is no excuse not to spend uh, effort on it at all levels across all sizes of the organization because the case is very compelling. I think everybody would agree that we all like to do market-driven innovation, that everybody would love to understand the market in order to really hit on the mark when you really bring out a new product. The market is diverse. The healthcare decisions are predominantly made by consumer females, female consumers. And it is a little ludicrous to think that old white male are going to understand how a 20 some year old uh, female in their prime or their sort of lifespan getting into, into building a family, taking care of uh, elderly parents and, and relatives would really uh, behave in, in, in their decision. So the market itself is making the case very compelling. And, and I do think that these same people that, I mean, if we're not diverse, we're not diverse. I'm not saying people can just wear a different suit and turn diverse overnight. But I'm a firm believer of tone at the top. There's no excuse not to talk the right talk. And that is not very complicated. And that is not really very difficult. It just has to be purposeful. Thanks, Maria. Donna, what, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you, Marga, first of all, for allowing me to participate in this uh, discussion. It's one that I'm obviously passionate about. And it's curious that you say, can you know, small to medium-sized companies afford to really have the luxury to think about diversity? And I would almost submit that they can't afford not to be thinking about diversity, not only about you know, gender and racial, but diversity of thought, um, really. Are you doing everything you possibly can to be able to meet the market needs, identify risks, to respond to those risks innovatively in a way that's gonna meet the needs of your investors and in the marketplace. And I think the data proves out over and over again, these more diverse teams, which I think is really the basis of diverse perspective and thought. And we see where we show up, you know, how we show up and um, my, our face and clothes is just one element of that, but it goes lower to levels to how we think about things in the unique way we think about things. And this is showing up in ROI. So I think it's a matter of as resources become more difficult, particularly in these times, 
where COVID for many industries has caused a constriction of funding. And we always go through these ups and downs. We've got to be thinking innovatively on how we deliver product. And you want the best teams. And I think the data talks about the best teams are the ones that are more representative of the ultimate customer base, which is the patient, but also bring some tension, productive tension inside the boardroom. Thanks, Donna. Love to hear your thoughts on this, Kwame. Thank you. I uh, joined Donna and Maria in saying thank you for this opportunity. And the way I think this cannot be operationalized, I know we're going to talk about a little bit more depth, is for people who are in leadership positions who aren't networked, having incentives for them to quickly get networked, whether you're a small business or a large organization. And we see models for this. We know that this can be done, and we know the data suggests that companies that do this go from good to great, right? Net, net, it brings value to the company and different stakeholders. So I think it's a matter of going beyond the case, and for those people who may be struggling for how to operationalize it, give them some tools to really get it going. You can start with capital. You can start with performance incentives and we, we can dig into more of this, but I'm excited because I think it's a time where we can just flip the switches and uh, 10X these efforts that have been around for many years now. That's really encouraging to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm glad all of you have this really optimistic viewpoint that it's not only possible, it's absolutely necessary. And there are tools that help us. And we'll, we'll dive into that as you alluded to, Kwame. But I'm going to, I'm just going to turn the screw a little bit here. Um, you know, particularly because I, you know, the, the world of Fogarty tends to be the small to mid-sized company. Um, and I've met with a number of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, so I'm going to dig into that a little bit. In smaller startups, where the future culture of a successful company is, is being formed, is being incubated, if you will, you know, what level of commitment to diversity are we actually seeing? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it may sound shocking, but, it, but it's, it's the truth. And this one serial entrepreneur was laying it on the table when he said to me, you know, when my investors are holding my neck on the line, and I can't afford to make mistakes. I'm gonna hire the people I know and can trust. I'm gonna stick to my own network. And, and the likelihood is that network is made up of people that looks just like him, as we've shown from the stats I shared a little earlier. Um, and in fact, it's borne out by the research. Um, a, a study of 260,000 people representing tens of thousands of startups and, inv and investors found that diverse founding teams have much more limited access to capital than white founding teams. And that most, 75%, I believe, of the rounds are raised by white founding teams, money. And very few of those teams diversify as they grow. So if they start out being 75% white, by the time they hit Series E, they're 55% white. Um, yet the talent pipeline is there and the track record of success is there. Again, stats showing that more diverse teams do better. Mind you, the same holds for the VCs, for the people who are doling out the funds. You know, an HBR study, Harvard Business Review study found in 2018 that the percentage of women in venture capital stayed consistent for 26 years, from 1990 to 2016, um, at 8%. And ethnic minority representation was, remained flat at like 2% and 1% and for Hispanics and African Americans, um, respectively. Yet again, funds that had women partners consistently outperformed funds that were homogeneous male. So my question to you guys is, what can we tell this successful entrepreneur who, who 
you know, his own experience has said, gosh, I've been successful before. I've done it this way. Why do I need to change? The formula is working for me. And all the stats I've just quoted are, are perhaps entering that person's head, but in their heart of hearts, they're scared. They're scared to make a mistake. How, how do we help people get outside of their networks? Do we have to get them uncomfortable to get diverse? I'll start with Kwame this time. I'll go in reverse order. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think it will be uncomfortable for that archetype of a founder. And what he, it's likely a he, is going to have to do is be willing to tap into networks where there's diverse talent. And as you were talking, I was thinking about HBCU VC, uh, Valence, a community all packed with people who are qualified to take on leadership roles in early stage companies, but it's gonna take that one step. Another way to look at it also from the capital side is incentivizing these companies with things called diversity riders so that the, the wire is contingent upon the company making a commitment to diversity. So there's no mystery about this, right? I, I, in preparation for this meeting, I read an article about a firm, Alpha VC, that just gave $2.5 million to six uh, VC funds managed by African Americans. And we all know in the scale of capital deployed in the VC community, this is a relatively lo a low number. So what we see from the capital side or what we need from the capital side, you know, great job for Alpha VC for, for making that first step, but we need 10x the amount of capital these funds are deploying to diverse fund managers who will be inclined and have networks of diverse companies. So to me, that's the biggest lever you can pull, put capital in the hands of companies that are already diverse. And the second lever you can pull is convince those non-diverse managers to incentivize them with capital. So those are my thoughts. That's great to call me and I've got, I could do a follow on question here. How, Often are we are we seeing this happen? You mentioned one one instance. Are we seeing more and more instances like this where there are directed funds? So I think Black Lives Matter has incentivized an increment, and I get this question fairly often, an incremental increase, but it's not um, revolutionary. It's not a step function. And when you peel back the onion, when you look at some of these articles, $100 million devoted to black and brown founders or companies, a good portion of that is debt <laughs> or other vehicles that aren't your typical investments in black and brown companies. Um, that's what I'm saying. So Donna, what, what do we say to this uh, successful entrepreneur who is scared to go outside of his network? You know, it's interesting because I think of startup entrepreneurs as some of the most courageous. They have that courage gene. But then in some aspects, they rely on, and what we've come to learn is a safety bias. All of us are hardwired to go with what's safe and familiar. And so it, it's interesting that you have kind of this um, duplicity and these leaders of the organizations. And I, I, I don't think that it takes much to convince that over time, yes, you were successful in the past, but this industry has changed and is going to change. So relying on what was got you to success in the past, it'd be very short-sighted if you think repeatedly the same methodologies, the same processes are going to get you to that level of accept success going in the future. So if you just kind of believe in that tenet, I'm almost thinking you don't want to go big. Like you said, let's experiment with one or two key placements. Because we know that over time, specific teams success, the probability of success decays. I love to use basketball um, as an example. There was a, a study that looked at fit and they actually did on average, now Chicago's Bulls is probably an exception, but on average for a basketball team, you've got three to five years to maximize yourself with that set team. And then after kind of that five year mark, there is a decay in the probability of success for that core team. 
And they did the same type of studies at Google, looking at teams, and they would just lift up a team and go to put them on another project, thinking that this team was successful, let's move them on. But what they saw is over time, you get more predictability. They are not as innovative. They don't, you know, see the same thing. So how can you infuse one or two members, take that risk, which is going to, again, give that healthy tension to just see some things differently. You can almost think of it as these entrepreneurs, as an insurance policy. Yes, you have your core team, but let's bring in one or two, you know, folks that I normally wouldn't go to. I'm asking Kwame for, you know, his Rolodex, so to speak. Okay, I'm dating myself. But, you know, his contact list of someone that I can have an insurance policy that is going to perhaps challenge us, bring a new way of thinking that is going to prepare us for a new future that perhaps the same methodologies are not going to win going forward. That's what I say. So, you know, bring it down to brass tacks. You, you cannot be fat and happy and hope to succeed in the future. All right, Maria, you, you are a serial CEO. You've actually had to live through perhaps what are some of these attitudes of, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to change my formula because it's too scary. What do you say to that? So I think there's a number of things and some have been said, I think Donna's so right. I mean, uh, this, this ecosystem is, is loaded with risk takers and people that are willing to really be uncomfortable on so many levels, but not this one. And I think that's what needs to change. This is not a nice to have. This needs to move into a must have. And if you're one of those leaders, just like you work hard for many things, you work hard to create incredible focus on execution. You work really hard to peel the onion down to what can be proprietary about your technology. How can you really create something that is so unique and so valuable? You do need to work a little bit hard to make sure that the talent that you have around your table is diverse. It is not going to rain diverse talent from one of these rare clouds in California one day, right? So I, I, it's going to be hard for me to tell someone that doesn't want to do it how to do it. Because if they don't want to do it, you know what? Sorry. <laughs> but, but if they want to do it, there's very much a how. First of all, I think for all the wrong reasons, it is no longer politically incorrect to bring inclusiveness, diversity uh, to the table in front of your board, in front of your VCs. Nobody's gonna shut that conversation because if somebody dares shut that conversation down, I think they are going to be on the wrong side of today's world. The second is, just like in a sales job, you need to read your audience, you need to research your audience. You can actually, I am sure, find someone that can be your inclusiveness champion within your venture firm. You can look at other portfolio companies and go look at people that may have built a more diverse talent uh, at, the, at the senior table and just engage in a conversation with a fellow CEO on the how to do it or refer to that as you're pushing your own inclusiveness agenda with your board and use that as a benchmark. So if you want to do it, there is totally a how to do it. And it is at your fingertips. And it is not a lot more effort than finding something high, high, highly proprietary or having sort of an, an incredible focus on priorities and execution and working really 20 hour days. So I, I, I I think it's a bit of a lame excuse. It feels comfortable. Yes, it feels comfortable, but so many, but I don't think comfort is why you are in this business. Sorry. <laughs> well said, you want to add something, Kwame? Yeah, and uh, I'm going to give a 15 second commercial for MedTech Color. We're a nonprofit with a network of over a thousand stakeholders committed to this. Many of them are um, viable candidates uh, of color for the medical device, uh, for roles in the medical device industry. And then there are a couple companies as part of their partnership with us who have uh, tapped our network to try and fill, hard to fill roles when they wanna diversify their candidate pool. And some really forward thinking early stage companies have reached out to us and said, we wanna diversify our candidate pool. Can we share this position with you? Uh, Tracy McNeil at Materna Medical has taken advantage of this. 
ResMed has taken advantage of this and they're part of a pitch competition we're gonna have focused on diverse founders uh, in early stage med tech companies. So um, for anyone watching this video, there's a population of a thousand folks committed to this uh, issue in the medical device industry. End of commercial. <laughs> I would call it a small commercial for Medtech women then, which I am not directly affiliated for, but that is yet there as a resource to tap onto the gender diversity that some folks may, may wish to, to be a little bit more, more networked into as well. And both of these organizations have membership that have extensive CVs and resumes. And these are small industries, MedTech. And so they can do their homework, you know, on these individuals and minimize your risk by selecting individuals that have, you know, recommendations and, you know, experiences that could be a fit for the CEE, CEOs who are looking to populate their management team with some diversity. Thank you very much. I mean, this is, this is very powerful, very inspiring, and it's leading right into the next question. So, you know, no excuses. I think I heard that. Just no excuses for, for wanting to do things the same old way. The environment is such that you can, you can grab the bull by the horns and talk to your board about diversity, talk to venture capitalists about diversity, and nobody's going to think any, you, any the worse or, or strange for it. So, so let's go into the good stuff. We've, we've examined what, what's been wrong until now. Let's, let's look at how small companies can think about diversity from the very beginning. You've already started giving some answers. You've given, you've given MedTech Color and, and MedTech Women as a, as a resource for, for talent. But what other resources are available? And, and you know, what works for mid-sized companies that, that some of our audience members might actually take away and apply for themselves? And um, Donna, I'm gonna sa save a, a question for you about larger companies. So I'm gonna start for smaller companies, start with Maria and, and then move on to Kwame. And I'll ask you about big companies and what, com Donna, and what small companies can learn from them. So uh, along, along the theme of the, the no excuse, I mean, uh, and you did mention that I got uh, very involved in D by D diversity by doing, um, the, the intent was really to create a, uh, an industry wide at the small company level around um, gender diversity to begin with. And in, um, um, ethical diversity as well and uh, as of the last uh, several months the the realization was that it was going to be really a a little bit easier for companies to tap onto a resource where there was an opportunity to get access to data to network or just to learn from others on the how to so we've done a number of surveys we have put together a summit in which we put a lot of very seasoned and senior people through very simple role play and talk about being uncomfortable about situations that were of unconscious bias, that were about really how if you go doing the same thing as Donna was saying, you end up with the same answer when you're thinking about recruiting or evaluating candidates or creating or putting together a um, I guess it wasn't socially distanced then, so now I don't know if you can do those things, but like a company-wide to males than it could be to, to females, depending on what topic was chosen. So, and then as of lately, we focus on mentoring. We discovered that one of the common denominators around career engagement and loyalty and really successful careers was really that, that a, availability of mentors. So we've done a few speed mentoring sessions, purposefully looking for mentees and mentors that were more diverse. So D by D was, was born as a, as a way to really give um, the industry a go-to place for how to become more inclusive. And one of the things that was fabulous was that at the same time D by D was born, MDMA and AdvaMed also uh, sort of led parallel efforts in which we tried not to duplicate, but tried to just be noisier together than separate along, along the same theme. And I think that starts bringing what I was saying before, this is a business imperative. This is not just an HR topic, the way everybody maybe thought about it. 
10, 15 years ago, this is a business imperative. And I think it needs, it belongs in the business imperative list. If it is an HR topic or an employee relations topic, I think then in itself, the tone at the top or the tone uh, conveyed is the, the wrong one. I, um, I, I think uh, everything, I agree with everything that was said and some things that I know are working um, are organizations with a commitment to this issue that operationalize it quite well. Pledge LA is a organization with money from the Annenberg Foundation that's raising $500,000 to invest in early stage companies led by black and brown founders in a socioeconomically depressed area of LA called South LA. Uh, so they're doing it. They're raising the capital. They're gonna deploy the capital in a meaningful way uh, in 2021. Uh, MedTech Innovator, the world's largest accelerator, is doing some internal work around uh, health equity. And I think you're going to see the fruits of that work in the out years. Uh, still early days, but I think it's going to be very powerful. And there are some accelerators that have a commitment to this. Scale Health is one with a membership over 200 early stage medical device, digital health companies, where they have a uh, commitment and it shows in their membership to have diverse leaders at, as members. So if you can connect yourself to like-minded organizations like these as an early stage company, uh, I think uh, you're in good stead. And we actually, MedTech Color is developing informal relationships with VCs who have contacted us and say, we want to fund diverse founders. How do we get access to them? And we've had a handful of VCs explicitly reach out to us that way. Uh, and the last thing, which I think is impactful, but not as impactful as capital, is VCs who say, we will have office hours for diverse managers to try and fill some gap in some area of service. Um, so that's another area. Oh, last one. McDermott, Will & Emery has launched a program to support with legal advice, uh, early stage founders with, with diverse management teams. So those are some real things going on right now. That is awesome to hear. I mean, you know, um, more power to them. And, and uh, I'm gonna commit to, to the audience who's watching this video that at the end of this video, we're going to list out all the resources you mentioned as well as um, their websites. So this is, this is really good. Thank you so much. Now, over to you, Donna. Feel free to comment. You've been in large and small companies, so feel free to comment on the small company question, but also, you know, fascinated by some of the stuff that Stryker is doing. So please talk to us about it and, um, and, and how do you think smaller companies can help adopt. Yeah, I'll be the representative for their big corporate um, behemoths. So, you know, it's interesting because I think Kevin um, Lobo, who is our um, CEO, has been extremely vocal about D&I, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and he very much is of the walk the talk. Um, and, you know, I know sometimes it's controversial, um, whether you call it quotas or metrics or whatever euphemism makes you more comfortable. But the fact is, is a lot of times if there, if you're not measured on it, it just doesn't happen. And so, I mean, it's just, that's the way we as a business objectives and performance, we are motivated to respond. So, you know, uh, first and foremost, I think he set out goals for himself and for the organization where he had a time period where he wanted his board to reflect and look like. And so literally he always starts, you know, meetings with pictures of the board in 2010 and pictures of the board now. And he's committed and said, you know, I, by this date, I want to have over 50% of the board that is represented by women and minorities. And he did that. You know, I want to have the management team by this date <laughs> that is over 50% represented by women and minorities. And he's pushing that down um, in the division. So there's kind of that 
uh, metrics piece of it, but there's also some very real initiatives that are about, you know, changing the way we think and changing the narrative around diversity um, and inclusion. It is, it is often a uncomfortable conversation. You know, nobody wants to be pigeonholed as, you know, a, a racist or saying the wrong things or um, that, and that it starts there, being comfortable of having the conversation of why you want to have somebody sit down in the table and stay at the table. So we have, um, and I know this might be harder to implement, but I think you can start on a small, small scale, basic training on unbiased, on biases, recognizing unconscious bias that all of us have. Doesn't matter who you are, what skin you show up, you and how you put your pants on. All of us have lens from experiences and perceptions that shapes kind of our realities. And he often says, it's not your first thought that you're responsible for, but it's your second thought and your action and really putting tools in place, simple things to challenge the way I think, am I changing my paradigm, going out of my boundaries of either because it's similar, or it's safe, or you know, it's near term versus long term fighting those biases. A really simple tool that you know they have us, and and you don't have to do it. I mean, these are some of the things that we get carrots for if you do. If you do, you get points, and those points can translate into financial uh, rewards. So on top of the metrics, there's also the um, fun piece, which is you kind of do a roadmap of your own personal demographics. And it's several questions. It's like, you know, who does my supervisor look like? What does my spouse look like? Who did I go to lunch with for the fast last five times? You know, what, what kind of music um, do I like? And you'll start to see your roadmap is looks pretty narrow. And so all you ask is choose one of those things and go outside of your com comfort zone. Have lunch with somebody that's different, you know, than what your normal circle um, is go to an event that you normally, you know, wouldn't go to. And these are the small things that causes these shifts in the way that we're thinking that will match up with what I think is a necessary piece of having metrics in place. That's really inspiring. And, and having heard Kevin Lobo also talk about it, it's, it's sincere, it's ingrained, it, it's, it's part of the fabric. And, and the little things, if you will, the small wins, to use a, a term that, that Stanford Biodesign uses a lot, you know, just have lunch with somebody different, attend a different event, do something that's slightly outside of your comfort zone, um, and, and then it'll become more comfortable, right? It becomes more comfortable, and it forces you to think about it, because a lot of these things we think is completely unconscious. You know, we don't mean to only you know, call the same people, you know, and interview the same type of people. We don't mean to, but if we step back and challenge some of the things that we automatically do, I think it will help in the long term, as well as putting goals for ourselves. That's great. Thank you so much, Donna. Well, we're getting close to the, the end of our time here. But I wanted to give each of you a chance to wrap it up. If there's like another resource you think our our, um, our VC audience or our small entrepreneur audience would love to hear, you know, shout it out. Uh, if if there's any final words of wisdom you care to leave behind, let us hear it. And I'll uh, I'll start from what on my screen anyway is is uh, my bottom right, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> So I won't, I won't use a re, I won't quote a resource, but I will give you a tip. Please do not fall into the why bother. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a small little thing, a sentence that you want to add to the end of a conversation, it's worth it because it will create to the talk of small wins and small actions before all of those incrementally get us there. If we just go silent, then we're guilty. If we don't bother, then we're guilty. We're not going to climb Everest tomorrow, okay? We're not going to go and change this 
it entirely in a matter of quarters. It's gonna take a long time, but all of us can contribute every day. There's something that we just shouldn't hold back. Thank you. Go, go for it. <laughs> Kwame. I would advocate uh, founders contacting Avamed, specifically the Accel Group for early stage companies, uh, because they've had a commitment to this issue uh, and been working on it for years. Uh, I think you're going to see more and more action associated with it from the CEO, Scott, on throughout the organization. There's a real, um, real motion to change the face of MedTech for the better. So I would connect with Avamed, join a cell uh, to, to, get, to get integrated with that organization. Thank you. And Donna, parting words of wisdom. Um, I read um, a organizational psychologist, Chad Hartnell, I believe, and he said, the more you misfit, the more opportunities you have to contribute. Meaning that the more you differentiate yourself um, within a group, the more that group can contribute and grow. And I would just challenge our community to think outside the box, whether you start to use your networks with MedTech Color or MedTech Women, Avamed, some of the universities like BioDesign, there are similar types of programs that are out there that you can start to broaden your network and your skill sets. And if you don't want to go all in, you can start by using consulting agencies and just experimenting with bringing in different talent into the organization and seeing, you know, what type of new insights you're able to get. So you can kind of dip your toe in, if you will. Try before you buy. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I want to thank all of you for what was a really spirited and, and highly informative and beyond that inspirational discussion. We can do it. We will do it. They, our industry thrives on, on being you know, disruptive. And so mm -hmm. we, let's, let's lead the way. And uh, with that, thank you so much for all your time and for your sharing your treasure with us. Mm -hmm.